Uh, and in the Tech for Teaching days today, Tony is going to uh, speak with us a little bit about the experiences of uh, making effective choices for synchronous online teaching, remote, uh, uh, asynchronous online teaching, and the hybrid models and high flex models that we may be seeing coming through in the, the upcoming years. Um, this is again brought to you by Teaching and Learning. We look forward to seeing what ideas are shared and developed in the course of the, the next few days. And please know that you are welcome to communicate any needs into the chat window. You're welcome to send me direct messages, post any questions that you might have uh, with uh, for Tony. In today's session, we're going to use the Q&A format here in Mentimeter. So you can submit questions at any moment in time. Tony will pause his presentation at several intervals so that we can have a Q&A period. Um, so know that you can submit them to the Mentimeter, you can type them directly in the chat window, and you can just use this little question and answer bubble on your device to connect and drop in your question. So with that, I'm going to introduce today's guest speaker, uh, Tony. Hi, Tony Bates, Dr. Tony Bates. Whoopsie daisy, there's my notes, so you all know how I'm working over here. So Tony is a senior advisor at the Chang School of Continuing Education from Ryer, uh, formerly of Ryerson University, now Toronto Metropolitan University, and a research associate at Contact North Ontario. He was a founding staff member of the British Open University. In 1989, he became the executive director of strategic planning and information technology at the Open Learning Agency in Vancouver. From 2003, he was Director of Distance Education and Technology at UBC, and he has worked as a consultant in the design and management of online and distance learning in over 40 countries. He is the author of 12 books, including his latest online open textbook for faculty and instructors, Teaching in a Digital Age, which has been downloaded over 500,000 times and translated into 10 languages. He has honorary degrees from Laurentian and Athabasca, Athabasca and four foreign universities for his research into online learning and distance education. Tony, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you at Conestoga. Uh, I, it's always uh, difficult being helicoptered into an institution without knowing uh, much about that institution and the culture, um, but I know that uh, you have some very interesting programs and we're all facing a really interesting transition at the moment in teaching and learning um, as we move into more integration of online teaching into our regular teaching. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Hope you can all see that. Um, what I want to talk about is making some choices um, and particularly how, how instructors can uh, have a sort of framework for making decisions. And I, I want to say very clearly at the beginning, I can't tell somebody teaching a trades course how to teach a trades course, that's your speciality. All I can do is to give you some general guidelines and hope that you can apply those to your own teaching and learning. And sometimes these guidelines just won't fit your situation. And I think I'm very well aware of that. Um, so it's really an attempt to provide you with some tools and it's up to you then to decide how best or whether or not to use those tools. So what I aim to do in this is to provide, do two things really, give you some criteria for choosing both about the appropriate modes of delivery um, and also about the appropriate use of different media. Uh, and the second thing I want to do, which I won't go into in much detail in this presentation because you can just go to the book to get that as it's free and online, but just some general guidelines for the design of high quality blended and online learning. And this is really driven by the fact that now we have a lot of choices to make. At one time, we had two distinct worlds, fully online and in-person face-to-face teaching. But now we have a continuum here from fully online through uh, hybrid flipped classroom aids. 
so some with no technology, face-to-face -face teaching, and then all technology at the other end. And what's even more confusing now, we uh, some instructors are, are moving to allow students the choice of how they want to take their courses in any one of these formats or a mix of these formats. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail in HyFlex in a second. I just want to emphasize that there are many forms of blended learning. There's technology enhanced learning in the classroom. You still have your regular classes, but you use a lot of technology. And you will see a, a, um, an active classroom here from Queen's University, uh, where the instructor sits like Captain Kirk in a pod, and the students each have their own desks with their own screens on the wall, and they can work in a small group, they can work in a whole class, and so on. And that's a, an interesting form of blended learning. As some instructors are, are keeping their lectures, but are also adding a learning management system and allowing students to do some work on the learning management system. And then there's flipped, where you uh, make a recording of your lecture and the students come in class, to, they watch the lecture and come in class to talk about the lecture. Uh, there's the Roll Roads model of one semester on campus and two online. And the one I'm most interested in is where an instructor sits down from the start and works out what they want to do online and what they want to do in person in the class. So it, it's worked out from the very beginning what the, the best use is going to be of the class time and the online time. And then, as I said, there's high flex. So there's all those choices for you. So how do you decide? So let me say a little bit about HyFlex. And I have to say, this is an emerging uh, topic. There's multiple definitions. I've seen quite different definitions of HyFlex in the literature. Um, the most common is having students in the class and the students online simultaneously. So this is kind of like a lecture, which like this, but some students will be in class and some will be online. And I have to say, I have lots of problems with that. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But another definition is that you, you have a, a, a course in multiple versions. Um, you have it as fully online or students come, come on campus or there's a mix and students can do the mix. As, so as I said, these are multiple definitions. However, Teaching must be designed to fit the context of the learner and the context of a student studying at home is very different from the context of them studying in a class together. When they're on, doing online learning at home, they're alone, they're distant, and they're usually learning asynchronously because the reason they're doing it online is maybe they can't get to the class because they're working or they've got a kids at, uh, sick at home or whatever. And then in class, students are with other students and teachers and they're learning synchronously. So these are different contexts. And that's why I think HyFlex really requires a total redesign um, so that you take account of both of those in your teaching. Um, in a sense, I think it's easier to go from a fully online course to a HyFlex program than to go from an in-person face-to-face class fully high flex in one go that that's a big jump for me um and yes you you can start off by doing a lecture uh, uh, in person and then having some students follow it online but that's sort of just the first tiny step towards truly truly integrated high flex teaching now I want to point out, it doesn't matter which mix of online and face-to-face -face you're using, there's some core requirements for all teaching. And the first one, of course, is to know your student's learning context. And the challenge, of course, is that we have a mix of students usually in our classes, but you know, some are, some are, uh, are older than others. Uh, some have, uh, are able to spend full time on campus, others can't. So you really need to get to know what that mix is and how different it is from class to class. I have to have clear learning objectives, of course, and I make a distinction nowadays between content about knowing things and skills about doing. 
And I think particularly in what I will call the uh, more intellectual skills, the higher order critical thinking skills, then I think we need to do a much better job at being very specific about how we take a skill um, which students may have some, some, some competence in that skill when they come and how you increase that competence as they go through your course. Um, and the other thing then, as well as having clear learning objectives, is to be aware of the affordances of different media and modes of delivery. And I'm going to focus particularly on the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning and the difference between the various media, uh, video, audio, text. And I like the term of media rather than technology because it allows me to consider in-person teaching as one medium of delivery. It's a medium of delivery um, and it can be different from a medium of delivery through audio or text and so on. And I'm going to say something about choice of media at the end. Now, let me talk about the term affordances. It's a bit of a off-putting term. It's really looking at the strengths and weaknesses of a particular medium, what it does best, particularly. That's what we're looking for. And particularly what it does best in an educational context. The term affordances, incidentally, came uh, up a long time ago, 1969, from a man called Gibson, and he was referring to things like doorknobs. Um, you know, if you have a metal uh, slab on a door, that means push it, and if you have a handle, it means turn it. It, it, it it's sort of inherent in in the design of what you should have to do. And I have to say that in terms of educational affordances, there's no real research on this. It's mainly experience, and I don't undervalue uh, the uh, experience. Experience is very important. So intuitively, we would think that in person is better for teaching hands-on skills. You've got to, you'll have uh, the instructor there giving direct guidance to the students as as they as they trying to use a lathe or uh, trying to uh, uh, do cooking and so on. Uh, we know that text is very good for evidence-based arguments and analysis. Um, the invention of the printing press led to a huge burst of knowledge because uh, you could put an argument down, everybody could see that argument, and everybody was looking at the same thing. And not, you know, it, 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 so it has certain contexts about uh, text that make it very important. And video, we know, is very good for demonstrating processes, for instance. Um, but the affordances aren't sort of general, they, they, they are linked to the subject matter, they're discipline based to some extent. So the use of video in, uh, in a trade is likely to be different from the use of video in teaching history, for instance, um, and which makes it rather difficult then to talk in generalizations about them. Now, I'm going to do something about the affordances. I'm going to talk about that, but I'm giving you some advanced organizers. Here are some questions I'm going to be asking at the end of this section. What in your subject area cannot be taught uh, online and why not? Could you think of a way that even though you can't, you can't do it now, you could teach it online if you had enough time and resources? And what would be the benefits of doing that? And any other comments? And, advantages uh, and disadvantages of in-person teaching in particular, because I'm going to be talking about the affordances of in-person teaching, particularly in the next section. So synchronous or asynchronous. Well, just let's be clear about what we're talking about. Uh, classroom teaching is synchronous. Everybody's there at the same time in the same place. Video conferencing live like this is synchronous. It's, it's, uh, it's at the same time but it's not at the same place. So even in synchronous, there's, there's a difference. Virtual reality is the form of synchronous teaching. Uh, asynchronous is mainly learning management systems, um, but text is an asynchronous, books are an asynchronous way of learning. We've had asynchronous learning for a long time, actually. And recorded video and podcasts, that's another form of asynchronous teaching. And the difference is that synchronous is same time and in some in some okay in some circumstances the same place you can get immediate response if you're in a class you can get students to respond immediately and they can respond with each other at the same time asynchronous is anytime any place 
And in the very important thing about asynchronous learning from a student's perspective is they can stop doing what they're doing, they can stop the recording, they can go back and look at it again and they can review it. And there's a huge amount of research in the past that shows that students learn a lot more when they have asynchronous control than when they have synchronous control. And in terms of discussion, it allows them to give a considered response. If, some, if, if they're in an online discussion forum, they can go away and look something up and come back and respond with evidence in, against the, the other person's comment and so on. So it, it's, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, they're different, but they allow for different things. So what makes in-person teaching special? Well, the default position in the past has always been that in-person is inherently superior to online learning. But we've had enough experience over the last 30 years and enough research to know that that isn't so. You can teach often just as well, if not better online than you can face to face. What matters is the conditions. You can teach badly online, but you can also teach badly face to face. So a high quality online course will be a lot better than a poor quality face to face one. Um, so that leads me to what I call the law of equal substitution. Anything can be taught as well online as in person, except, and it's the exceptions we should be focusing on in in-person learning, learning. And that, so I, I like to put it this way. Why should a student get on the bus to come to Conestoga? What are you actually offering in class that they couldn't get online? because it's a damn sight more convenient to do it from home than it is to get on a bus and come into class. Now, there's lots of good answers to that question, but I think every instructor now needs to ask that question when they're teaching. Why get on the bus? Why are the students coming to me? What am I offering them that they can't get some other way? And I suggest there's three different factors that will determine that, the answer to that question. One is the type of students. The second is the subject requirements. And a third, very important, are a lot of non-teaching issues, which are still very important for learning. So we, we know quite a bit about what students like from past experience now in, in online learning. We know that older, more experienced learners with family often prefer online learning. Now, again, it's difficult to make generalizations. You'll always find an exception to every one of these rules because into human, uh, into, you know, we're dealing with human beings here, but in general, uh, that's the kind of student that likes fully online learning. Now, with students with part-time work, and we have a lot of students who do in part-time work, they may not be part-time students, but they're part doing part-time work, or with family responsibilities, they want to mix. They want to still have the campus experience, but they want the flexibility to be able to study online as well. And we also know that young students fresh from school and students without adequate internet access or equipment at home, and you should expect at least five to 10% of your students not to have internet or equipment at home, they'll want the in-person experience. So horses for courses here. The problem is you're likely to have a mix of all these students in any one class, which is a good argument for high flex. This, the second area and one I want to focus on are the subject requirements. And as I said, it will vary from subject to subject, but generally we know that theory content and soft skills like critical thinking uh, can be taught uh, just as well online as in person, if not better sometimes. And we know that hands-on practical work is best done in person. But there's no theory or evidence-based justification for this. This is all based on experience. So let's ask the question, why in person? What can't be done online? What are the affordances of in-person teaching? And as I said, hands-on skill, social learning and trust, getting together to know people, getting together for the students to know their instructor and the instructor to know the students and for the students to know each other, then there's a lot to be said for bringing students together. And if you want real-time interaction, if you want students thinking on their feet and spontaneity, that's another uh, strong affordances of in-person teaching. 
But I have to say that nearly all that list can be achieved online with good design. So it's not that it's unique to in-person, but it might be better in-person than online. The non-teaching factors, um, these are very important for many students. Uh, the social life of a campus is very important for many students. The bonding and building trust, as I mentioned, Support facilities, somewhere quiet to study. That's very important for a lot of students. They don't have that at home. They might have younger brothers or sisters. They might have uh, kids running around the house and they want somewhere quiet they can go and study. Uh, informal counseling, chance meetings with instructors. That's all really important for on-campus teaching. But for some students, uh, they will give up that for the convenience of online learning because that's more important to them for their lifestyle. So it, again, it depends on the student. Now, as a result of re emergency remote learning led to a whole burst of research, most emergency remote learning was, asynchro was synchronous online, lectures online, and it didn't work very well, as you all know. There was too much passive screen time, students weren't active enough, too little student interaction, students were overloaded with work, both in, and, and instructors were as well. It wasn't an efficient way of working. It was a necessary way of working because of the pandemic, but it, it, it wasn't the best way of working. If you're going to do lectures online, considerable ad adaptation is needed. Shorter presentations or shorter sections of 10 to 15 minutes broken up with uh, interaction, which is what I'm going to do in a minute. Uh, and certainly access to recording. Some instructors were very reluctant to record their lectures because they wanted students to attend, to be there in person. But that was a big, big problem for many students who found it difficult to concentrate for the 60 or even sometimes 90 minutes and they wanted the recording to go back to it. So let's have some questions and some interaction. What in your subject area cannot be taught online and why not? Could you think of a way you could teach online if you had the time and the resources? What would be the benefits and other, any, any other comments on the advantages of disadvantages of in-person teaching? And Jesslyn, I'm gonna be looking at you for some of the, um, questions and comments, or you can just I'll hand it to you because you're better at doing this than I am. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I've shared the link for the, the Mentimeter again in the chat window, but uh, as everyone knows, you're also welcome to maybe just turn on your mic and ask any questions. Tony's had the chance to go through a little bit of the various modes that we see now in teaching that maybe, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't really see as much of. Um, and let's kind of take a moment and think about uh, what our subject or our content areas really lend themselves well to. And where's, where are the avenues that are really great for online learning as we look forward into uh, hybrid models that, that might implement both online learning and in-person affordances. So now's the time to kind of think for a moment and consider any questions that you might have for Tony. Certainly thinking about ways that you could teach online if you had the resources or any other advantages or disadvantages that you're thinking of or advice you might look to. I know for many of us at Conestoga, we're looking at Tony into the hybrid model and thinking about, you know, how do I really craft the differences between my in-person session and my, my online? So I have a course, it used to be completely in-person and then we did this emergency on remote thing for a couple of years. And now I'm looking at it and looking at moving it into a hybrid delivery. And so now I'm looking at, you know, what really belongs in that synchronous session and what really is a good fit for that online component? And how do I make that online com component feel like a community that my students want to participate in? Maybe can you start us off with some thoughts about that? 
uh, I, I see somebody has put a question is what is Hyflex at Conestoga? And so it would be interesting if anybody has been moving towards a Hyflex model uh, in the audience, if they could say how they're doing that. It's interesting. We do have some faculty who have experimented with it. I shared that link as a, a resource for people to open up if they're interested in learning more about what high flex looks like at Conestoga. And Tony, I'll, I'll say I'll preface this to say that we have several um, classrooms that are built at Conestoga that are high flex classrooms. We are looking in this the fall semester to just start piloting it with a few uh, select faculty who have um, voluntarily stepped forward. But we've done a really, I think, comfortable thing at Conestoga, which is we've taken our baseline classroom and we've just enhanced it with cameras and monitors to make it a high flex experience. So really for many of our faculty, I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic that you'll walk into a high flex classroom and it'll feel like every other classroom you've walked into. Um, just now with the ability to join a Zoom session and, and some cameras that, that preview your students at the back of the room. So I'm hoping that we've made, we're, we're looking to move towards a system where a high flex experience is one where the technology tries to be as invisible as possible. So maybe here's a good question for you to give some advice on, Tony, is what have you seen in, so far as far as successes and challenges of the high flex model? What advice might you have for us? For I, that? I think the most successful one is at Queen's University in uh, Kingston. Um, what they found was that just the redesign of the classroom in, into uh, group tables and screens changed the way that uh, the instructor taught the course. Um, the instructors, the, it, it, the, the teaching was shaped by the room, um, which is quite interesting uh, because a lot of our teaching is shaped by the traditional classroom. You go into a lecture theater, you're gonna lecture because you've got all those students in front of you and so on. Um, if you build a classroom in a, a more interactive way, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on student group work uh, and sharing that work. So uh, I think the building and the uh, what goes into the room is very, very important. And I think there are major implications here also in terms of cost, because if we're going to move in that way, there's quite a big cost in changing rooms and buildings. But we might be better doing that than building new buildings and extra classrooms as we expand and having uh, some of that teaching done fully online so we can put the money into building classrooms that are more interactive than they are at the moment. So that, that's one thing. But you don't need to spend a lot of money. You can, if you have a room where you can move the tables around, then um, that, that may be enough to change that you have, put students in groups and then start off with that. So the actual room itself um, can be useful, but then you've got to have those PowerPoint um, power connections where you can students can plug in and do work online in the classroom as well. So that's very important as well. So it's not just a question of moving the desk. You've got to have other things in the class as well. And I'm glad to hear that you're putting some of that some of those facilities in. But just putting a camera at the back of the class, I don't think is enough. No, no, yeah, and we've definitely um, gone beyond that. There's microphones in the classroom. Um, there's more equipment than just that, but we're hoping to make it so that it doesn't feel like it imposes um, so much on that that in-person experience. You know, we don't want people to walk into a room and feel like they have to set a lot of things up for this to work. We want it to just kind of work yeah. from the get-go. Yeah. yeah, and you're right to point out that there is cost, but I think there really is um, an established benefit here as well. Now, we have some questions in the Q&A here. Right. Uh, and some people really noticing some challenges. So what I'll do is I'll present a few of the challenges that people are suggesting, and then the question that kind of follows those challenges. So one person notes, in-person labs are very difficult to teach online. They've tried to move those into an online format, but it just presents such a challenge. 
And in another challenge, another person notes that in their class, they find it challenging to teach sub, uh, sensitive subject matter online. They can't read students' nonverbals or body language to see whether or not they need more from that person emotionally. So there's two contexts wherein uh, those two examples are, are kind of substantiating that there really is still that need for that in-person teaching and learning. And one person asks, so will high quality face-to-face -face learning typically be secure, superior to high quality online learning? No, not necessarily. It depends on the student again. Um, uh, you can have very effective, uh, Ontario back in 2011, uh, the, the provincial government uh, surveyed learning outcomes from online and face-to-face -face courses, found no, no significant difference when the class was offered both face-to-face -face and online. They found no difference in the student performance. Um, so um, it, it's, it's not a function of the mode of delivery, although it may affect certain subject areas like in-person uh, hands-on work in the lab. So again, overall, basically the differences are greater within each mode than they are between the modes. So you can get a more variation in face-to-face -face than online. You get a wide variation in uh, online learning quality as well. So mm -hmm. they cancel each other out. So it's not a, yes, it, it, you know, you can't say, well, we can put everything online. That's not true. Uh, it, in the same way we can't say well everything can be taught just as well face to face you have to look at the different circumstances but generally with good design you should be able to now coming back to the to to the labs again it's a question of money and time it's been shown there's two ways of teaching lab work online one is to actually record it and design the labs on video and then have activities built in that students can do at home that would fit with the lab work. Now, and you can't always do that. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. The other are um, uh, virtual labs. In other words, you have a real lab, but the student controls the lab equipment from home. Um, and uh, Colorado Community College system has done that extremely well. They covered about 30 to 40% of the curriculum that way without the students having to come in. They've had to come in for the rest, but. So there are things that can be done, but you've got to have, you've got to redesign, you've got to have spend money to do that. And that's a problem. Yeah, I'm really glad that you're touching on the way that uh, simulation, simulation and virtualization can really contribute to that online learning experience for that lab context. In our faculty panel, we just had some examples of ways that faculty at Conestoga have developed simulation experiences aimed to target those exact skills. Those things that like, you know, you really should be in person to see that piece of equipment or to experiment with that process. But for those of us who are not, here's a, a simulated experience that can get you part of the way there. Um, and I think that there will be a lot of innovation in there as well. I have a follow up question, Tony. Uh, so this person is asking what techniques are available to encourage and engage student thinking and participation in asynchronous content as opposed to just passive viewing of content. So yeah. some of the techniques and, and strategies to engage students in the online experience. Uh, I will come to that a little later, but it's basically making sure you are building lots of student activities, a lot of student work to do online. Um, that's the great thing about a learning management system. It, there's lots of opportunities to put in activities for students to do work. Now they can, we, we can talk about the importance of instructor presence so that, that, that students are aware that you're uh, looking at what they're doing online as well. Um, not in a nasty surveillance sense, but just that you're interested in what they're doing. And, uh, but it doesn't mean you have to respond to everything that students do. You don't have to assess everything they do online, but they, students do need feedback uh, and they do need to know that what they're doing, uh, the activities they're doing are okay or, and so on. And you can use other students as well. You use, do it as group work online. Uh, that often works very effectively, but the main thing is to give students plenty of activities to do online. 
And that may mean cutting down on the time you spend or the time the students spend watching presentations of content. They can go and find the content online or you can provide the content online. So you don't have to spend all your time delivering information. Um, uh, I'll come back to that later on. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate the thought about putting the pin in the idea because we're going to get to that more later. Thank you, Tony, so much for taking some time to yeah. address a few of the questions right now. Right. Uh, would we, you like we, to continue? We can come back at the end to some of the other questions as well. Yeah. Okay, I think you need to be aware of the fully online environment. As I said, the fully online learners often tend to be older and more mature, which is good because they have to have the skill of independent learning and the ability to manage their own learning. And, and that's a taught skill. Um, that's a skill that can be taught. Uh, that's why I like the idea of starting with some online activities and maybe in the first year of a program, but going more to online learning and in, 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 later in the program. So this is a cur curriculum planning issue about how much online learning should there be in terms of how mature and how experienced in learning the students are. And most online learners stunning is only part of their priorities. They have uh, other things in their lives that also have priority like family or work. So they require a lot of flexibility. They need to fit it in when they can. And the really important thing from a pedagogical point of view is that they're often studying on their own in isolation. So the design of the course must try to break down that isolation by linking them to other students online, by knowing that what I call instructor presence, that they, they know the, the instructor is there for them uh, while they're studying online. And so online students do need quite a lot of support and guidance to manage their learning. Uh, for instance, uh, in my book, I talk about having a uh, an idea in your mind about how much work a, a student should do all together in one week on your course, knowing that they're probably doing five or five, four or five other courses at the same time. So I, I, I like to have a figure in my mind for teaching a three credit course or so something like eight hours total study time each week for that student. And then I design the activities and the work, uh, the assignments and so on around that notion of eight hours a week. Um, appropriate technology, they have to have that. And again, uh, COVID showed that there were quite a lot of students who didn't have the appropriate technology uh, at home anyway. Um, and again, it's useful to check for that. And there really should be a strategy if you're going to require students to study online at Conestoga, the college should have a, a strategy for dealing with those students that don't have appropriate technology at home. It can be quite simple, like loaning them an iPad, or it can be more complex, like looking at grants and so on. But there should be a strategy for recognizing that there will always be a significant, a small but significant number of students who don't have appropriate access. Um, and you've got to design the teaching for the online context. As I said, you've got to make sure that students have lots of activities when they're studying online, uh, and they don't feel isolated. They feel that other students and the instructor are available to them. So let's look at some of the affordances of asynchronous online learning. And this is really built around the learning management system. Before COVID, 93% of Canadian universities and colleges were using a learning management system. And this really still remains for me the core tool for online blended learning. Um, it's flexible, students can do any time, anywhere learning. Students can stop, start and replay. It, it's a multimedia environment. You can embed, if, you, if there are very good reasons for doing uh, online lectures, you, they can be embedded within the learning management system as just one other activity that they have to do. Uh, you can, it's very good for workload management uh, because it's structured. It can be structured on a weekly basis. Here are the activities for each week. That's where I talk about the eight hours uh, for, uh, per week per student. Um, you can have structured interaction via online discussion forums. And really importantly, it can help change the method of assessment to make it more authentic. You can 
for, for instance, you, if you're trying to develop a skill through a course, you can see what the student is doing online in, at the beginning, uh, in the middle and at the end. So you can actually assess the progress as they go. You can have continuous assessment quite easily because with online learning, there's a trace, the record of what the student is doing. Or you can use e-portfolios where students uh, collect, do activities, collect those activities together and put them in an online portfolio of work, which can then be assessed at the end of the course. So that there's lots of affordances of asynchronous online learning. And so one strategy for choice on the, on the what I would call the teaching side um, is to identify your overall teaching approach and identify what learner activities are necessary to help them learn on that course. Look at the resources that are available and then analyze the most appropriate mode for each learner activity. And what I've done here is to take uh, a lab class uh, where students have to uh, analyze what uh, the, the glucose content in blood. Um, and some of it can be done online and some of it can't. So you break down the activities, what the students must do. They have to learn the theory and the te terminology. Um, that can be done online just as well, or probably better than face-to-face -face because they need to stop, start, go over and make sure they understand, comprehend everything. Observing the actual analytes under a microscope, well, that probably has to be done in class. They have to come in and do that. But they, you could teach the design setup using virtual equipment. You could show them all the bits and pieces they would need to do an experiment um, online and ask them to assemble that and do, do the activities in the right order to do the experiment. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to show video of interactions that happen uh, under a microscope, which might be quite difficult to do in class, and if you can get a good recording of that, then the students can study those uh, interactions online and probably a lot easier than they could in the lab. If they have to insert glucose into the blood sample, that's obviously a hands-on activity would have to be done. So you, you could do a lot of preparation online and then the students can come in and do the face-to-face -face, face -face activities in class. Tony, if I may, we have some really good questions that I think follow your line of thinking and your line of advice here from the yeah, audience. Go ahead. So I have two that are sort of parallel. I'll read them both at the same time. So the first person says, you know, we have asynchronous courses that are really well designed. How can we get students to do the work? Some students aren't really working through the material. And another person says something very similar, which is when we use asynchronous learning, sometimes we have to revisit that content in person because the student hadn't really understood or engaged. How can we overcome these challenges? Yes, well, student engagement, uh, there's a whole uh, raft of, act, uh, uh, of guidelines on making sure students are engaged in online learning. As I said, one is activities, one is feedback from the instructor on their activities. Um, I think that students often need, if it's their first online course, they need a lot more help than they would if they've done an, already done an online course. And I often spend the first week, or if I can get away with it, the first week before the term starts, introducing students to some of the concepts of online learning. For instance, I get them to post a bio, I get them to, uh, uh, with their permission, of course, to post a bio so that the students can see who, who else is there. I put them into groups so that they can uh, talk to other students. I have what I call a cafe, an online cafe, where students can chat. Students on that particular course uh, can chat about anything they want, uh, uh, hockey or anything else outside of the course, uh, and they get to know each other that way. So there's a whole range of activities, and I, I, I've got quite a few of these in the book that, student, that can, an instructor can use. Now, in terms of getting them to do the activities, I hate to say it, but assessment is the best way. If students know they're gonna get graded on what they do, they tend to do it. They know they don't have to 
they won't get a grade and they don't have they feel they don't have to do it so and again you have to be fairly sensitive in the way you do this you can't just assess everything because it's too much work but um for instance with discussion forums i link every topic for a discussion forum to a potential assessment question at the end of the course. So students know if they participate in this discussion, it's gonna help them with the assessment question at the end. Mm -hmm. They don't know what the assessment question is, but I can say, I'm gonna be asking you about this in the exam. And I want you to discuss this in terms of what we've covered in the course. Mm -hmm. um, so again, assessment is a big driver of student behavior. Um, uh, and again, I try to avoid big end of course assessments on, with online courses. Um, first of all, I hate sitting down, spending two weeks marking student assignments. So, yeah, so that's a personal preference. But by continuous assessment, and I let students know how I'm grading them as they go, so they can see where they are on the course as they go. And, and that is a motivator. I know some instructors use a competitive approach. They post the grades every week um, so students can see what the other students have done and let them go back and improve their answers <laughs> and, and then upgrade their grades as a result. Um, so that's another way. I, I'm not sure I, I altogether approve of that, but, um, but that's another way of engaging students is to put, put some kind of competitive element in. So student can, the, the other thing is transparency with online learning. You want to be as transparent as possible. You want to be very clear what your learning outcomes are, what your assessment is going to be, what students have to do, because they can't pick up those hints in class uh, like they can in class. They, they can't sort of pop up and say at the end of the session, I really didn't understand that. Do I really have to know this for this course? You know, because... I'm more, much more interested in this. You don't, they can do that online, they can ask that question online, but they're less likely to than they are if the instructor's around. So there are things you need to build in to engage the students. And it's a design issue. Yeah, I would, I appreciate so much some of the themes that I'm hearing you talk about, about, you know, the importance of really priming students for that online learning experience and whether that comes sort of before the course or within the course itself. Uh, that valuable role that we play with our own instructor presence for supporting students in that that online learning experience. And then and then that tidbit that you're offering about thinking about the scope and scale of the assessments and how continuous assessments can really drive motivation for for learners. I think those are some really valuable takeaways. We have another kind of follow up question. Tony, and this might be a food for thought kind of question, but I'm, I'm really curious to hear your, your response, which is, should we have sort of an online college that exclusively focuses on providing programming for older students that prefer online, rather than the model of all colleges kind of providing their own online courses? What is the merit um, of the model that we, we use where each college provides their own online courses to you? I, I, I put it more to do with the, the level and the type of course. Um, uh, you might have an online college, for instance, for uh, updating and retraining in areas where the, the, the subject content has changed a great deal over the last few years. Um, we know that many students are facing retraining needs that their jobs have gone and they need to retrain for a new job and I think if you had a kind of college that focused on the needs of those kinds of students um, because they already have a fair bit of knowledge they don't need the same content repeated that they had earlier uh, and they need a very flexible way of accessing that because they're still working and so on uh, Micro credentials is another area where you might want to uh, have a, a kind of separate area where the micro credentials are very clear to what they, they count towards. Can they be used as credits within your other courses and so on? So, again, it might be ha worth having a, a, a kind of program area that goes across the college looking at micro credentials so that they're consistent 
they, they are of the same value in different subject areas and employers know exactly what they need, you know, what they mean. So I, I can see that there, there, there may be good reasons for, for having a separate fully online uh, college of some kind. But I, I, the, the, the danger of that is that everybody sits back and says, well, they're doing that. I don't have to do it. Um, what, what, what I'm more worried about is making sure that all departments have some component of online learning within their courses. Um, not, not necessarily fully online, but being integrated with the in, in classroom teaching. So, and by isolating online learning into one college, there's a danger that the other shift in, in the college's teaching won't take place. It will delay the innovation within blended and hybrid learning. That, that's my only concern of having a, a separate uh, department or college for that. These are really valuable uh, kind of big picture thoughts as well for us to, to learn from. Tony, we have more questions, but I wonder if you're about to kind of address some of the themes that they dive into because they're, they're really thinking practically about the experience of the other teaching modes as well. So I'm gonna let you continue on with uh, the ideas that you had planned to share. And then at the next Q&A session, I'll bring in the next set of questions. Okay. Um, I just want to point out there are many different media available to, to, to us as teachers now. Uh, we're, in my view, grossly under, under using some of these, particularly video. Um, each of them has certain benefits for teaching and learning, uh, depending on the subject area, um, like text for abstract ideas, graphics for visualization, audio for language learning, video for dynamic, showing dynamic change, computing for objective assessment, social media for collaboration and in-person teaching. So or defining the affordances as a work in progress. But I want to point out how, how, how easy it is now to use technology compared with just a few years ago. Um, on the right is a is very good example. This is from the vet school in uh, University of Prince Edward Island. And the instructor there, she had a plastinated animal's heart, but she only had one, they're very expensive. It was a dog's heart. Uh, so she only had one for a class of 30. And she always had problems with students crowding around this, this and, and you know, not having enough time to, for each student to take the thing apart. So what she did, she made a very simple video with a mobile phone uh, she took the parts away, she demonstrated the parts, and then on the part itself, she put a QR tag. So when students came in, they'd photograph the QR tag. That was the URL link to the video that she made, which they could then download. So very, very simple use of video, very, very effective because the stu each student then had their own individual demonstration of how to uh, have the various parts of the, of the heart and how they interconnected and work together. Um, there are a lot of existing apps out there uh, that can, you can use for teaching. Uh, at UBC, they took a, one of the Quest uh, apps, you know, where you have to go and find things in different places and adapted that for teaching so, uh, soil sciences. So students will go into the forest around UBC and would use this uh, Quest, Go, uh, Quest to Go app to find the different locations and then take uh, tests of the soil, uh, report the numbers back and email their findings back to the instructor, then would come back into class and she would go through it all. Uh, very good for interviews, for doing audio, audio or video interviews. Uh, if you're looking at traffic management patterns, for instance, you can go out and video an intersection and see how the traffic works, bring that, students can bring that back and analyze it. Um, elevator pitches in business, uh, getting students to do a two minute video to pitch a business. Um, and the other students can then critique that and they can then improve it and so on. Or teaching practice is another area now where students are recording their teaching practice or nursing, uh, and then they record it and then they reflect on it. And they say, well, this is what I learned from this situation. And they can put that up online as well. 
And then students can do blogs and wikis, course content. So there's a lot of simple technology out there. And the really important thing is that students have access to this technology. They can use this technology to demonstrate their learning. Um, so it needs just a little imagination on, the, on your part as an instructor to think how students could be using this technology and how you could be using simple technology like your mobile phone to, to demonstrate things that are often difficult to demonstrate in a class with lots of students. And lastly, I'm coming to media selection. How do you choose this? And if we're talking about affordances, we're only looking at one of the issues here. That, that's the media characteristics and how you're going to use the media. There's lots of other things to be taken into account. Who your students are. If they're mainly adults, then there's more likely to be want online learning, for instance. How easy the technology is to use. That's really critical. How much cost and time do you have to put into the, the technology? Uh, is it something that uh, will take a lot of time and money? How much interaction does the technology afford? Can students interact with this or is it a one-way uh, broadcast system? What are the organizational issues? Uh, if you wanted to redesign your class, that's a big is organizational issue. If you wanted to put technology into the classroom and so on, you've got to go through a whole set of activities uh, with the admin and so on, and that might well stop you using the te technology. Does this technology allow for networking between the students and outside maybe? Um, and what is the security and privacy around this technology? That's a really important issue these days. That's why I like a learning management system because it's password protected. It's a, a sort of closed environment in which the instructor has some control over what happens within that environment. As soon as you go out onto social media, then I'm not saying you shouldn't use it, but you have to be very careful about the risks of uh, abuse and so on if students go uh, start using social media. You can't stop them to use it, they're gonna use it anyway. So you may wanna build that into your teaching, but you should be aware of security and privacy. Mm -hmm. Tony, if we can pause here, we're, we're coming around to our final few minutes, um, and I've shared some resources to the, the um, audience about the sections model and about applying it to use uh, to select the appropriate tech. Um, and I'm really taking away some of your themes about, you know, variety of materials and activities is really going to help those online and synchronous experiences and the variety of student products, you know, whether we're asking them to perhaps produce digital content like blogs, wikis, uh, websites, rather than maybe necessarily physical products sometimes and what role that might play. And then using the sections model to really carefully consider the merits of the technology that you're using. And our faculty, I hope, um, know that they can also reach out to our teaching and learning team for support in considering the technologies you want to use in your teaching and applying those. We have a few questions in the, in the, the Q and A, um, Tony, for you. And one I think kind of asks for a bit more detail on what you're talking about right now. So this faculty member is saying that um, <clears throat> one of the key challenges that they're experiences, experiencing is that every week we have the same schedule, you know, a fixed amount of numbers of hours online and a fixed amount of numbers of in-person. But on a week to week basis, our content changes so much mm -hmm. uh, and it can be really strongly weighted in one week and then and then lighter in another week or or vary so much in the content matter. So how do we optimize that student experience in our delivery with the content changing so much, but the time and the um, the hours really being fixed. What's your advice here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that question. Um, a good one. Uh, the, the, the issue here, <laughs> the more we go into a blended and hybrid learning, the bigger headache we're giving to our administrators in terms of classroom scheduling, for instance. Uh, uh, and again, what we're finding is the classroom schedule is, is to some extent determining the pedagogy. Uh, rather than the other way around. In, in, other, in other words, saying, this is the way I want to teach. Can you give me a, uh, an environment that allows me to do that? We're saying, well, here's the physical environment, and we have to work within that. 
Um, and I, I realize that's a, that's a real tension now, and that's gonna get worse as students demand more and more flexibility and so on. So I'm not sure there is an easy answer to this. Um, I mean, I, I can see the administration's frustration here if they have these classrooms and they're only being used say one third or two thirds of the time because the students are teaching online. So how can they, uh, and if that varies across, uh, if you decide in one week you want to have everybody in class and then three, week, three weeks later, every, everybody working online, that's very, very difficult from an ministry point of view, as well as from, uh, so, so we are constrained by, by those things. But again, I, I think there needs to be a lot more discussion with the administration about the implications of teaching online for classrooms, classroom design, classroom availability, and so on. Um, I don't have an easy answer to this though, but I recognize it as a problem. Yeah, thank you for your honesty in that one. It is it is sort of a, a challenge that that we'll experience and grow into in the next coming years. So I guess as a, a final a final moment, I just want to say thank you so much, Tony, for coming today and for sharing your your years of knowledge and experience. I know you had so much more that um, you wanted to share. One of the perks to doing this is that um, we have these presentation slides. Uh, I'll be sharing them after today's session with the audience. It was also shared in the pre-email that you received. Um, and I'll touch on that Tony's book, Teaching in a Digital Age, is free and openly available. I've shared the link in the chat window. I'll go and get it again. Um, but there's lots of nuggets of advice in that text for anyone teaching in any digital context, which is now the new reality that we, we live and work in. I know I myself refer to this text on a frequent basis. It's got a wealth of advice and knowledge to share. And so even as we wrap up our time in person with you today, Tony, I know that you have so much leave behind to share with us as well. I'll invite any of the audience members as well to submit any questions that you might have either to the Mentimeter presentation or to me by email and I'll forward them along to Tony um, to he's offered to to give us some leave behind follow up advice and you'll see it posted as well to our faculty learning hub. So thank you again so much, Tony, for your advice today for for just sharing the wealth of knowledge that you have about um, teaching in general and online learning specifically. It's been really a valuable treat for me to hear you speak and we really appreciate the time you've given to us today. It's my pleasure and uh, good luck. Uh, I don't envy everybody. It's a big challenge to have change, change. And uh, as my wife says, you're very good at getting other people to change, but you don't change much yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Change is hard and uncomfortable, isn't it? Uh, but I know the faculty at Conestoga, they're so resilient, open to new ideas, um, and just a, a fantastic group of, of committed and caring educators. So I know that uh, especially the people who've shown up today are really going to benefit from what you've shared today. Thank you so much, Tony. My pleasure. Thank you. Good, good luck, everyone. Yeah. Thank you all in the audience. Uh, remember that the recording from today's session will be available on the Faculty Learning Hub and shared out to you as a community following the event. Take care.